welcome. My name is Lisa Lavallo Seppos, and I lead Google Maps platform sustainability products. I'm pleased to host today's talks at Google with Mauro F. Guillen, author of the new book, The Perennials, The Megatrends Creating a Post-Generational Society. Mauro is the for former Dean of the Business School of the University of Cambridge in the UK, and currently a professor and vice dean for MBA for Executives at the Wharton School. He last joined us three years ago to share insights on his best-selling book, 2030, How Today's Biggest Trends Will Collide and Reshape the Future of Everything. Today, I'm looking forward to hearing from Mauro about his new book, The Perennials. Mauro, welcome to Talks at Google. Nice to see you again. Thank you so much for inviting me, Lisa. It's uh, great to be here. I was really excited to get my hands on your book, new book, The Perennials, um, because everything you write is just so uh, interesting from your unique worldview. Um, and I think it's so thought provoking. The Perennials is really no different. Uh, our audience will soon see why. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody that we'll take questions from our viewers towards the end, and you may be posting those in the chat as we go along our conversation today. Um, and please visit the link in the description to buy the book, The Perennials. So, Mauro, can you tell us a little bit about why you wrote this book? Well, I wrote this book, uh, quite frankly, Lisa, because uh, I was uh, becoming very concerned about how people keep on talking about generations as if they actually existed. And, uh, you know, we are in a situation in which generations uh, are in conflict with one another. I mean, younger people accusing older people of climate change or uh, and uh, resenting that they have to pay for the pensions and all that. And I thought I would, uh, you know, uh, give it a shot at that, trying to see whether a different kind of setup in labor markets, in educational institutions, at companies could be found where we can have generations learning together, working together, living together, as opposed to being separated and uh, distinguished from one another all the time. Great. That, I think that's something that resonates with a lot of us as maybe uh, we might be trying to be marketed to as, you know, a millennial or a Gen Xer or a boomer. And, you know, we hear about these labels all the time, but maybe they don't quite fit. Um, so could you tell our listeners, um, what is a perennial? How should we think about this concept? Yeah, the perennial is somebody who doesn't think and doesn't act his or her or they, their age. So it's somebody who you know learns or works at whichever stage in life without really thinking whether that's uh, what uh, they were told uh, many years ago that that's what they should be doing. So we have perennials who are now in their 40s and they're in medical school learning, right? Uh, we have perennials who are working side by side with uh, other people from a completely different age group in the workplace. And you know, uh, research on teams demonstrates that teams that have age diversity are more productive and they're also more creative. And perennials are also people who, you know, quite frankly, they don't think as retirement as that big price. So they prefer to keep going. They prefer to be useful. They prefer to not be isolated. They prefer not to watch so much TV, which is what the average American does uh, when they retire. That's what a perennial is. There is something, uh, I think, in every chapter of your book that spoke to me. Um, I think so insightful as we go through different stages of life, but a lot of times they're colliding at the same time. And I think what particularly resonated with me is that I'm a working mother who prioritized education and career early on and then had children relatively late. And I'm facing many of the trade-offs between career, motherhood, leisure that you highlight in the book and kind of experiencing what others might associate to a particular generational moment in time all at the same moment. Um, and reading it from your perspective really turned on this light bulb for me about this, the challenges of this sequential model of life. Um, and it's like, really, there's all these points of friction. So can you tell us more about where these challenges are and what friction the sequential model creates for our society? Yeah, and it does create uh, quite a few frictions and problems for women in particular, because you see, the model was designed for men, men like myself, right, who don't do enough in the household, okay? We don't spend enough time with the children and so on and so forth. So the problem really is men, but it's also the kind of system that we put in place more than 100 years ago, actually, that was designed for men. And it was, hey, when you're little, you play, then you go to school and you better learn everything that you need to know for the rest of your life at school because that's your only chance, right? And then you work. And hey, most Americans, as you know, Lisa, they hate their jobs. So they work, but they're told, you know, keep on working because you need to provide for your family. But not only that, you know, if you save money, if you're good, then you'll get a big prize at the end of all of this, which is retirement, right? So maybe you'll suffer for 40 years 
working on something that you don't like, but you end at the end of the, the, that journey, uh, you get to retire and then you can enjoy everything in life. So this doesn't work for women. Why does it work for women in general? Well, because uh, again, men don't do enough and uh, women then have to make choices about you know, the timing, for example, of when, as you said earlier in your case, when you pursue learning, when you pursue working, when you start a family and so on and so forth. Men, you know, they don't generally are not affected by career interruptions, but women are. So when we change the system, though, and we made it a little bit more flexible, if we built into it more degrees of freedom, I think that could help a lot of women, professional women like yourself. I definitely think it would help too. Um, I think it's, um, you know, goes back into history, as you're mentioning, over 100 years, where lifespans were shorter, career tracks were almost singular, where you would commit to one career for your whole life. Sometimes the whole uh, career would be at one company. And we're really seeing a, a bunch of those demographic and lifestyle shifts happening. Can you talk more about those specific points that we've seen different uh, today versus 100 years ago that need to be updated in how we understand our entire lifetime? Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's primarily three changes. So the first one is, hey, big news, we live longer. So today, there's 12,000 people in the United States who are turning 60. They're celebrating their 60th birthday. And they have another 24 or 25 years ahead of them. And that's another lifetime, right? I mean, what are you going to do? Are you going to be watching TV in retirement? Uh, that's too long a time, right? And perhaps they don't have enough money saved or set aside for, for retirement. The second big change is that we stay healthy much longer than in the past. So a 60-year-old today is in much better physical and mental shape than a 60-year-old, you know, 40 years ago or 50 years ago. I think about my father. I'm close to 60. I think about my father. And I'm in much better shape, both mentally and physically, than he was uh, at about my age. Uh, what that means is that we can be productive. We can have the lifestyle uh, of a young person for much longer, right? And then the third big change, and this is where I think uh, Google, you know, plays a role, is technological change. So technological change essentially means that Whatever it is that we learn at school becomes obsolete much faster now. So we cannot hope that whatever we learned at school when we were in our teens or our 20s, that that knowledge will last, will be relevant for the rest of our lives, for the rest of our longer lives, our much longer lives. So that creates the need to actually go back and forth between work and learning or to be a lifetime learner and to essentially approach careers in a very different way. So not just uh, one career, uh, uh, per person, as you said earlier, but rather maybe people, you know, can switch careers. Today we have a lot of people in their forties in the U.S. who are attending medical school. Fancy that, right? At that stage in life, they decided, "I want to be a doctor." Yeah, that's right. And you um, cover in your book that maybe we should expect to have three careers or more in our lifetime, um, but this may often require getting re-educated in a new career field or um, needing some other components of the ecosystem. It costs money to go to school. It costs time to go to school. Um, and so there are moments in life when we face these trade-off um, points that we have to consider. Um, and, um, you know, especially with the role of technology, um, it could be both a disruptor, but it can be an enabler. And I think you make that point uh, here in terms of all the new things that we can leverage technology for. So from your perspective, what role can technology play in driving more of the perennial lifestyle and fitting more into the way that we naturally would rather be um, performing kind of various stages of our life? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Lisa. So technology disrupts, but technology also helps us find solutions. Uh, and in this case, I think technology will make a huge difference. It's not just remote work, uh, but it's also remote learning, digital platforms, and so on and so forth. All of this is going to help us move more fluidly between work and learning, or perhaps even learn while we work. Uh, so it's going to make it so much easier to make all of those things compatible. And in so doing, then individuals will be better able to adjust to all of the changes in the labor market. And the fact, as you know, that companies are looking for other things every day, right? And it's very difficult to actually study when you're 20 or 25 uh, for the jobs that are going to exist uh, 30 years later. So I think this is going to help individuals adjust. I think this is also going to help companies be in a better position to attract the talent that they need. So technology is going to play a, a really, really important role in all of this. I think that's a really critical point, especially where companies come into play. Um, obviously, companies like Google have a global scale and can help bring a lot of this technology to market. But 
really kind of all companies have a role to play here, whether it's um, allowing more flexibility to, you know, uh, step aside and maybe shift your educational focus um, and, and help with a career pivot or um, potentially be more accepting of online education credentials or facilitate things like that. How should companies think about their role in shifting more towards the perennial framework that you're recommending? Yeah, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, I think the answer is uh, relatively straightforward. Companies need to experiment. So we still don't know exactly what the best approach to all of this is. But they should begin to experiment. They should create teams that are truly multi-generational because we know they have higher productivity and greater creativity as well. Uh, they should be experimenting with new ways of thinking about how they bring people into the organization. Because most companies bring relatively young people into the firm. Uh, well, how about hiring those people in their 50s or 60s who have still another 60, I'm, I'm sorry, another 20 or 25 years of life ahead, of working life ahead? Um, well, the race for talent is so um, you know difficult these days that companies really need to start thinking creatively about people uh, or potential workers or employees in their 40s, 50s, or 60s. And as you said, companies should also create more opportunities for their workers to be completely up to date, to refresh their skills, and to be able to work and at the same time learn. This is incredibly important. But then technology companies like yours, uh, they need to help other companies accomplish all of this because really the answer lies to a very large extent in technology. I couldn't agree with you more, um, especially with what we're able to bring today. I know I had such a joy taking your classes um, at Wharton and just learning so much and technology has the ability to make this so accessible. Um, like I know um, lots of universities and other programs are putting together these online courses that make it just so much more accessible. And I think there's a role that we can play um, in bringing more of this into kind of a uh, like more globally accepted credential to help people pivot in careers. Oh, absolutely. And uh, quite frankly, I would beg you that uh, actually you create more uh, learning solutions for everybody to use around the world. Uh, and I say this because that will create more competition. That will, uh, will diversify the supply of options for people. And I think uh, universities such as mine uh, would benefit from that additional competition because we're very sleepy. We change very, very slowly. And uh, we need a uh, some kind of a shock, an external shock here, uh, so that uh, we stop doing what we've been doing for the longest time, which is we classify people, as you know, into age groups. And then we offer separate degrees for each of them. So we have undergraduate programs, we have graduate programs, we have executive education programs, and so on and so forth. And this is the old system. This is the old way of thinking about this. Now we need to bring the generations together. And there's big benefits that the economy and that specific companies can reap from that. This is almost like um, the concept of dissolving problems. So um, one of the things I really love um, in your book was this concept of, there's kind of two ways to approach these challenges. One is solving the problem. And you kind of like look at what you've been dealt and you come up with a solution to make things maybe work a little bit better. But potentially what we're going towards is actually dissolving the problems of removing preconceived notions of this sequential model of life, removing what we think about kind of going through each stage one by one in the perfect order, um, which actually creates a lot of frictions. And how can we reorient ourselves around dissolving these problems, making them just go away um, as a different way of handling them? Can you oh, talk absolutely. about this? Yeah. Absolutely, Lisa. I mean, yeah. you're hitting the nail uh, right uh, head on. I mean, the, the thing is, you know, we're very used to essentially coming up with solutions uh, that address some kind of an issue that we're facing. But then, as you know, every solution creates another problem and another problem and so on. Mm -hmm. And we need to learn how to dissolve the problem uh, altogether. Uh, so think about the people who are sidelined by all of this, right? Teenage mothers or people who drop off from high school. People who, as you were saying, don't make the transition to the next stage in life at the right moment. We have very few ways for those people to actually regain, you know, their position in life and be able to enjoy all of the opportunities that every or most of us enjoy. Uh, so, so we really need to address that before we multiply the problems as opposed to just uh, dissolve the problems, meaning we eradicate them. Great, thank you. Um, I'll pause here to remind our viewers that we're going to be taking questions from you at the end of this 
fireside chat here. So feel free to pop those in the chat and we will get to them in just a few minutes. Um, great, so um, you talked about kind of other groups in society for whom this doesn't work well. Um, teen mothers, maybe folks who weren't able to finish high school. What are other groups in society for whom the current sy system doesn't work well, but maybe it could? Well, we have, uh, for example, people who at some point were abusing a substance and now they're recovering and hey, they lost uh, opportunities to uh, you know finish their education and so on and so forth. We also have uh, people who uh, didn't have parents and so they were sent to the foster care system and uh, they also had trouble uh, because on average they, they uh, you know, they don't uh, make uh, progress as quickly as other, other people at that age. Uh, but more broadly, I would say, going back to the uh, topic that we covered earlier, it's also women in general, right? Um, because the system doesn't really work for them. So it's really important, I think, to realize that if we don't help those people get back into the system, um, because, you know, at some point they miss the transition from one stage to the other. What we're doing is we're perpetuating something that could be a big cost to society. Not only we're missing out on their talents, but also generally they require resources, right? So on both counts, uh, it's actually costing society. Uh, there's an opportunity cost and there's a real cost there. And uh, we should be able to actually eliminate those costs to the benefit of not just those people, but everybody in society. Is there a role for government to play here in shifting this paradigm? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, let's uh, think about government in two ways. First is governments are big employers. So in other words, if they change their employment practices, for example, by, um, you know, in the workplace, putting the resources together by thinking about hiring not just uh, young workers, but also workers at more advanced ages, if they provide their employees with lifelong learning opportunities and so on and so forth, then it would be making a huge impact, right? And in fact, the private sector may imitate some of what uh, the government could do in that respect. But also governments regulate. Governments, you know, like uh, there's a tax code, there's uh, regulations here and there. Um, there's uh, programs that the government uh, organizes to help people. So all of those things matter. Let me just give you an example. Um, probably everybody in your immediate uh, social circle at work or uh, where you live has a 401k. And as you know, if we use a 401k uh, for another purpose, we uh, withdraw money too early, then you get penalized. Well, I actually think the IRS should change that rule because if you want to use your 401k money to go back to school, that would be a great thing that you could do because probably then you would want to work longer and therefore there would be less pressure on the social security pension system later, right? And, and we would be using that money for something that would be more productive. You see, retirement is not productive, but education is. And so I think we've completely misunderstood what the priority should be. The priority should be to emphasize the learning opportunities that people have available to them, not the retirement opportunities. And the 401k is is designed, specifically designed, to maximize retirement opportunities, which is doesn't contribute anything to society, quite frankly. Such a fascinating way to look at it. And, you know, we can go on and on about the government's role in Social Security and kind of all of the other um, contributions that there may be here. But I think particularly um, for folks who are approaching retirement, um, what do you think they can take away from their book? Oh, life. don't do it. Don't retire. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, Lisa, I mean, here's the thing about retirement, okay? So retirement has been oversold. Uh, retirement, um, again, has been promised to a lot of people because, hey, we generally don't like our jobs, and therefore we have this big price at the end, so we work very hard so that we can retire someday. It's much better to enjoy life from the beginning rather than have to wait until the end to do all those things that you really want to do. But more importantly, look, the system is broken because... 40% of Americans who retire eventually go back to work either full-time or part-time, 40%. And 52% of people who retire early go back to work either full-time or part-time. Now, keep in mind that retiring early in our culture is a sign of success. It's like, oh, that person, my neighbor, retired early. He or she or they must be really successful, right? Um, and that's wrong. I mean, most people actually hate retirement. Uh, because you lose cognitive ability, because you decline physically, because you get isolated from your social circle. It's a bad idea, but it's especially a bad idea now that we work, that we're living much longer, right? This is the problem. When, when the first pension scheme was introduced in Germany in the 19th century, in the 1880s, 
um, people were promised, men were promised um, a pension at age 62 or 63. But, you know, this guy Bismarck, who was running the country at the time, was very smart because the average life expectancy of a German male at the time was 52 years. Now, today, the situation is just the opposite, right? So this cannot work. Now, I'm not telling people that they shouldn't retire. All I'm telling is that we should provide people with opportunities not to retire if that's what they want. I would certainly love to uh, exist in a world where maybe we can work part-time for longer and then we can get some part-time leisure in to enjoy it while you know, we have lots of things going on, while we have young families, while um, we have a big appetite to travel to remote locations, which can be some you know, physically exhausting um, exertion to go through. And, you know, it's hard um, to think about how much time we still have in the few in, into the future, especially with our health spans increasing, like you mentioned earlier. Um, is there something that we should think about when, you know, companies and governments are expecting a certain cohort of of folks kind of in, in my general age range to be the most productive contributors um, to often the top and the bottom line and most productive contributors to society. But actually, we're also in the peak of our, you know, physical, um, you know, abilities and our appetite for adventure and, you know, spending time with young families. Um, is, can we ever get to a world where, you know, where you're, you're working to live and not living to work? Oh, absolutely. But we have to change our mindset. And uh, we have to also agree that, as you said, that um, we should be able to move back and forth between leisure and work and learning more fluidly or to have some kind of combination, you know, one third, one third, one third throughout our lives as opposed to, uh, you know, first you work and then you retire and you enjoy everything. And, and here's the other thing, right, which uh, I, I, I think is uh, really, really important as well, uh, which is that uh, people are different. Uh, we cannot impose just one way on everyone. Because then what happens is that a lot of people, you know, they miss the transition, they don't like it, uh, and then it costs society quite a bit, both in terms of the opportunity cost and in terms of the actual cost. So we're all different. Uh, so let people decide then how much leisure they want to have, how much work they're going to have, knowing that they could work, you know, these days, the average American, until age 75, quite easily. If that's what they decide to do, to have more leisure earlier on in life when they can do parachuting, Right, or where they can do contact sports, something that you cannot do if you retire at age 75. I'm gonna keep dreaming. I'm gonna keep dreaming and keep hosting talks um, with you and we can go on a road show and go convince people that this is the way that it needs to be. Um, I'll remind folks, um, especially if this is thought provoking for you or if you have questions for Mauro, please pop them in the chat. We'll get to Q&A shortly here. Um, we'll continue on our talk here, but wanted to make sure that we're able to address any questions that come in from our viewers. Um, all right, so we talked about retirement people, we touched on young people, but I, I think young people is a really interesting uh, dimension here because oftentimes there's so much pressure to decide, even when you're a teenager, which track you need to pursue, right? It's so important to think about your um, post-secondary education. If you're gonna go to college or a trade school, you some places you have to select your major. If you don't select the right major, you can't do the right career. And it can be a lot of pressure. And how can we think about taking away some of that pressure for young people? Absolutely. And I think the answer is, uh, again, relatively straightforward once you change your mindset, right? So we're telling young people now that they have to make up their minds. They have to grow up, right? And uh, decide what is it that they want to be for the rest of their lives. Now, this is unrealistic because technology changes things so quickly that uh, you know, the jobs that are gonna exist 20 years from now, who knows what they're gonna look like and what kinds of skills people will need to uh, perform those jobs. So it's better to be able to tell our younger folks, look, experiment, you need to decide for the next 10 years because you're gonna have a second chance to go back to school. You're gonna have a second chance to switch gears or to switch careers. You're not gonna have to you know, stay in the same line of uh, work for your entire life. So take it easy, relax, but as opposed to that, as you know, Lisa, what we have is really high rates of suicide, high rates of stress, and so many other ailments among young people because we put so much pressure on them. This is not working for them. This is not working for employers. This is not working for anybody. Yeah, and I know there's always been so much research around um, doing things that make you happy or things that you enjoy that you can get lost in. Um, 
And maybe that's more a part of the message too. It's like, you don't have to get it, you know, maybe quote unquote right from the get go, but you can pursue something that, you know, you could, you have a while to determine if it's a good fit, if it makes you happy, if it can, you know, maintain the life that you want to have for yourself, but you don't have to commit to it forever. It's not like, you know, a decision that you make when you're 18 or 20 is something that you have to stick with until you're 50 years old. Um, and, and like, how can we just, you know, bring that into maybe our school system, which again is part of the sequential model of life. Everybody goes to school until they're 18 years old and they learn a curriculum that's largely the same everywhere. Um, and how can we bring in more kind of experimentation or more flexibility um, into this stage of our life um, to help everybody get a little bit more comfortable with, um, you know, you don't have to get it right, right off the bat. Yeah, absolutely. I think we need several actors to change their ways. So we need employers to change their ways. As I said, you know, uh, conveying very clearly that uh, they're happy to hire 20 year olds, but they would also hire 40 year olds and 50 year olds and 60 year olds. We also need to change or to um, make sure that uh, career counselors at high schools or in college, that they also change their tune. Uh, because frequently what they tell the kids is that, oh, you have to make up your mind, right? It's not just the parents who say that. It's also the school counselors. And so there's so many people who need to change so that we can start making the transition towards this other model, this other system in which we have more degrees of flexibility building. And by the way, if we don't change, I think the market will force us to do so because companies are now looking for talent that is more malleable, for people who are ready to switch careers, for people who... You know, today they're doing this, but tomorrow they're doing something else. People who have the ability not only to learn new things, but also to un unlearn older things. So all of this is becoming so important that I think sooner or later, we will realize that the market, you know, rules and that we cannot, uh, you, know, fight, uh, you know, swim against the uh, market trends. And that uh, the new world of, uh, you know, the economy where technology is really important and knowledge becomes obsolete very quickly, requires individuals who are more flexible and who can change very quickly. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, we'll see if uh, we get any more questions rolling in on the chat. We'll take those in just a couple of minutes. Um, we, we covered a lot of points, Mauro, but your book goes into detail about so many trends and so many kind of shocking pieces of data, like what you mentioned in Germany, I think, where you said, um, you know, 100 years ago, retirement age was 52 years old. Um, you know, I know pl plenty of people in their 80s and 90s. Um, are there any other like shocking trends or maybe some like less obvious statistics that we don't really consider, but that are driving a bunch of um, kind of the challenges behind the sequential model of life? Well, I think, uh, you know, I could produce many examples, but perhaps uh, one or two that we haven't uh, covered yet uh, is that, uh, you know, we always have heroes in all of these stories, right? So I think women in general who, like yourself, are mothers, but also pursue their careers are heroes, right? And one thing that, that you know, blew my mind away when I was looking for the figures on this is the percentage of American married women who make more than their husbands has grown to 29%. Can you believe wow. that? 21%. Now, when your mothers, uh, our mothers were around, right, uh, working and that, doing all those things, it was like what? Like, 1% or 2% of married women who made more than their husbands, it was extremely rare. So in spite of all of the obstacles, in spite of all of the, you know, um, difficulties, women are really making a lot of progress, or at least some women are, right? But again, we cannot generalize because then there's other women who are, you know, facing a lot of trouble, like teenage mothers and so on and so forth. But the point, uh, the point of all of this is that, um, you know, change happens, right? So when people tell me, oh, you're describing a utopia in your book, well, who would have thought 30 years ago that there would be so many women who make more money than their husbands? Change does happen, and it actually happens more quickly than we realize. So, you know, you were saying earlier that you're dreaming, you know, that would be the life that I would like to have. Actually, I don't think you need to dream. I mean, we need to, you know, roll up our sleeves and get moving in that direction. But we need to bring corporations on board. We need to bring the government on board as well. You never cease to give me hope. Uh, just optimism with the, these kinds of insights. I really appreciate it. I'm a huge optimist. I know. <laughs> um, great. All right. Well, it looks like we've got some questions here. So maybe we can pivot to some audience questions. We've got a few minutes here. 
Um, let's go to the first question coming in from Simone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. What was the most surprising thing you discovered while writing this book? Uh, that's a great question. So I think the most surprising thing, and I hope you don't work in marketing, uh, is to what extent people in marketing who whose job is to be on top of the new trends, right? Whose job is to anticipate the next big thing. To what extent they're still thinking under the old system? You see, most marketing these days, if you watch TV commercials, for example, they, um, you know, they're targeting nuclear families, families with two parents married to each other, one or two more children, a dog, a cat, a car, a washing machine, a refrigerator, and so on and so forth. That's the nuclear family. That's only 18% of American households, down from 40%, right, when Nixon was in the White House. What do we have now? We have lots of people living alone. It's not just widowers. It's also people, young people, who decide that they want to, you know, live alone. So they do. And then we have a lot of children living with one single parent, okay, much more than in the past. And we have a lot of people, young adults, ages uh, 22 to 32 or 33, who are still living with their parents, nearly 50%. Can you believe that, Lisa? Nearly 50%. Uh, oftentimes because they don't have the kinds of jobs that will enable them to become independent or because they really like the laundry arrangement at their parents. <laughs> um, so the point here is that things have changed, but marketing hasn't changed that much, right? And in particular, it hasn't changed in terms of uh, thinking about people as perennials. A lot of marketing, a lot of stores, think about, for example, fashion stores or clothing companies, brands, they still market their stuff to specific age groups, not realizing that a 60-year-old or a 70-year-old nowadays can have a very young lifestyle, right? It's very different from 30 or 40 years ago. There was one guy the other day who was telling me, look, I purchased a car that looks like a box. I'm not going to mention the brand, but it looks like a box because I like the bike. And it's the only car where the bikes fit inside. I'm like, uh, you know, taking the bikes uh, on top of the car. And he was telling me, but nobody, right? He's in his 60s, nobody at the dealership would actually offer him that car because they thought, oh, that's for young people. And he was protesting, I'm young. I'm still biking many miles a day and I'm 63 or 64. This is, so marketers haven't really changed their tune. And they need to, it's astonishing to me to what extent they're still thinking that the US or the world looks like 40 years ago. That's a really, really interesting point. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, thank you for the question. another question. Okay, Melissa. Melissa, so happy I to see you here, Mauro. I think I know Melissa, former student of mine as well. So happy to see you there, Mauro. Thank you for this brilliant talk. How do you see the role of Gen Z and TikTok in challenging norms and bringing about this paradigm shift to the mainstream? Well, look, I mean, every, every cohort of uh, young people uh, they're very creative, they're very dynamic, they have a lot of energy. And, uh, you know, oftentimes they come up with uh, great new things, right? But let's also think that uh, these days we're seeing an increasing number of influencers uh, who are old, right? So it's not no longer, even on TikTok, right? So it's no longer only people who are teenagers or in their early 20s that who become uh, influencers and who come up with the next big thing and then everybody follows it. Uh, but more importantly, what we're seeing is cross-generational influencing. This is, for me, the most interesting aspect, right? So is younger people influencing really old people and vice versa? Uh, once again, because the lifestyles have converged, right? Because we stay healthy much longer, and therefore, a 60-year-old can have the lifestyle of somebody considerably younger in terms of chronological, biological age. Uh, so I think we need to move beyond uh, those kinds of uh, think thoughts. But I would agree with Melissa that uh, I'm always surprised as to, you know, the next uh, thing that uh, people um, come up with uh, in, on a platform such as TikTok. It's, it's truly fascinating to, to watch. Yeah, now with the rise of the grand influencers, we're seeing some actual kind of social media personalities with very large followings. And it's not necessarily just followings from um, people from their same age category, but also, you know, uh, younger people who want to learn from them, who respect the wisdom and, you know, especially on uh, TikTok or other platforms where people go to learn things and kind of connect um, to others. Um, we're really seeing this missing of interest across the age groups where um, it's a great platform for people to learn from each other. Absolutely. And if I may add, uh, 
to that, uh, Lisa, there's also the uh, cross-generational mentoring at work, mm -hmm. which is becoming really, really widespread. Uh, I'm not sure whether you're seeing that in your workplace, but you know, increasingly we have younger folks, you know, employees mentoring older ones and vice versa. And again, this is all to the benefit of uh, everyone, including the company, because productivity and creativity tend to increase under those circumstances. Great. Shall we go to another question? Of course. Great. From Dave, I believe. Uh, what is your opinion on lower birth rates, declining populations in some countries? Is it a big problem? What are the possibilities for how it resolves? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I'm, I'm going to, I think, enjoy answering it. So I think, uh, you know, if, uh, if one is concerned about climate change, about the pressure on natural resources in the world, about pollution, about uh, plastic, uh, you know, contamination, all of these things, I think, quite frankly, we would be better off with a smaller population in the world, right? Or at least with a population that doesn't grow the way it has been growing in recent decades. Uh, so I think that actually is good for the future. The problem, Dave, is not the long term. The problem is what happens in the next 20 or 30 years while we make the transition from high population growth across the world to much lower population growth or even a stable population, which is what I think is going to happen in the end. The problem is that transition because as we're going through that transition, then you're going to have a lot of people above the age of 50 and very few people below the age of 30, let's say. So in the U.S., we used to have five people working for every person in retirement. Now we only have two people working for every person in retirement. In Japan, they're approaching only one person working for every person in retirement. And of course, that makes things really difficult, right? We start having all of these intergenerational conflicts. Uh, so people accusing, you know, others uh, from other generations for everything, all of the problems in the world. Uh, so the transition is what's difficult. But I am actually very happy. You know, I don't expect everybody to agree with me, but I'm very happy that population growth in the world is actually slowing down because this means that uh, we're going to be able to then also slow down climate change and we're going to be able to slow down uh, the pressure on natural resources and contamination and uh, pollution and all of those other problems as well. Great. I think we have uh, time for one more audience question. Um, if we can flash that one up and maybe you can get to it quickly and then we'll wrap things up here. Um, from Ajay, Mauro, fascinating talk. Did your research wander into the extreme scenarios such as genomics and stem cells uh, increasing lifespan by 50 to 100 years? Are there any hints as to what would be the biggest challenge? Yeah, so I, I do cover that topic in the, in the book and I present both views to the debate. So as you know, there are the so-called immortalists who want to pour all of these resources trying to increase life expectancy as you say, to 50 or 100 years or 150 years. And then uh, there are those who believe more in quality of life, and especially healthy life. So this is a real trade-off. I mean, do we allocate more resources to living longer or to staying healthy longer or both, right? So I think there are some tough uh, decisions to be made over there. And I know your company, Google, of course, for the longest time now, has been investing in all of that. And I actually talk about it in the book uh, briefly. So I think this is a, um, a really important question. And there's a trade-off that we all need to debate and we all need to discuss. And at the end, I think we need to find an answer once again that caters to the needs of everybody. Not everybody feels the same way about this debate. Right? Some people would prefer to live 200 years. I don't know what they're going to do, uh, you know, uh, living that long. But uh, other people would say, no, give me only 100 years, uh, but healthy years, right? Because as you know, being um, in poor health can be a drag. I mean, it can be really bad. Uh, so it's a big debate. And AJ, um, I think it's uh, great that you're raising this question. And I do cover it in the book. And my view is that, um, at least in the short term, we should try to improve the healthy number of years that we have. So the average American stays uh, healthy for all of the life except for the last uh, six or seven years. So the last six or seven years for the average American are years in poor health. And it can be really bad. So it's best if we, I think we push that to, oh, we live our entire lives healthy. That would be fabulous. I totally agree with that. I'm personally interested in making sure that we can make the most of the time that we have, uh, however long or short it, it may be without maybe some of the aids of science, um, but especially where we have the opportunity to improve the health that we have, um, get to enjoy more of the good years. Um, you know, and 
kind of take advantage of um, increasing health spans um, as we see them today, I think it's a really great opportunity. Um, well, thank you to everybody for submitting those questions. Thank you to Mauro for um, answering uh, questions from some of our viewers. Um, maybe just one final uh, question for you. Um, with your book, The Perennials, are you trying to make successful people even more successful? There's lots of tips you know, for people who like really have kind of the resources and are have a support structure, um, you know, but it's not the same for everybody. So are, are you trying to maybe also help people who are not successful to become successful by changing the way they think about things? I know, absolutely. So uh, I think it's fabulous if uh, people who are already successful become even more successful by applying some of the tips in the book. Or if uh, we make this shift towards the perennial, you know, society, perennial way of life, uh, that more people are successful. But I think, uh, you know, the book is also for people who have been sidelined, as we were talking earlier, uh, by the current system, uh, who missed uh, a transition and therefore they missed the, the train. And now they're having a lot of trouble. Uh, so my hope is that the book will help actually retrieve most of those people from the doldrums and help them have a, a, a life uh, full of opportunity. That's really the reason why I, I wrote the book. Uh, well, thank you so much. And I know um, you're the ever optimist and, and have a hopeful perspective. So I hope that comes through um, with all of the readers of, of your book, The Perennials, The Megatrends Creating a Post-Generational Society. I'm really grateful that you're able to share these insights with us, that you've brought them um, to uh, you know, the global population through the publishing of your book. Um, folks can uh, visit the link in the description to buy your book um, and just wanted to thank you for spending the time with us today um, and engaging on these interesting topics to maybe change the way that we think about uh, how we want to go about our lives and the, the change that we might be able to have in uh, the systems in which we operate. So really appreciate it, Mauro. Oh, thank you so much, Lisa. And let's hope that we can be happier. Uh, throughout uh, our very long lives. Thank you for inviting me. It's been an honor. Thank you so much.